um, and she can lead us away with the program. Thanks, Carlene. I'm um, really thrilled to have such a great turnout today. We've got a lot of people here that are really, really important to the college that have made significant contributions over the years. And I want to start this official launch of our new first year program by acknowledging that our college is situated on Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis. I think that we more and more appreciate the sustaining power of the land we share and the many contributions our ancestors have brought to this country, our community and our college. And these perspectives and talents bring us to where we are today and remind us of the power of community and the importance of looking out for each other. So welcome to all of you on behalf of the college. This opens a significant new chapter in our vision and the way that we think about engineering and engineering education. I want to start by thanking Ron and Jane Graham, whose really, really transformative support very early in this project allowed us to take this dream from a concept to a reality. They allowed us to, they, they have funded the salaries for the team of curriculum development people and taken us through the period of development. And uh, this has just made a tremendous difference to what we were able to do. Through the whole five years of development, you've both been an unwavering source of support and encouragement. And we just want to thank you very much for sharing our vision, trusting us to accomplish it, and empowering us to do things differently and in a much, much better way that will inspire the success of our students and produce graduates who have a very solid grounding. We are so grateful for your partnership and the impact of your support is just amplified through the efforts of our team and it has a, a really, really big impact on our students and their experience of the program. Now, as we moved from program development towards implementation, our community, our larger community, stepped up through the Engineering Advancement Trust and alumni donors to also make things possible and to continue to grow the vision. So I want to thank the many alumni who have supported the Engineering Advancement Trust and the trustees and volunteers who rally the support of our alumni community. Your gifts over the past three years have provided us with the ability to aim for the standard of excellence in our labs and in our classrooms and within this program. So even today, as gifts to the Engineering Advancement Trust support the final stage of program development, the gifts this year will update and enhance our re-engineered first year labs. And this directly translate into meaningful advantages for our students, as you'll hear from the design team. Um, I just really, again, want to thank everybody who's made this work possible. The challenges of today are significant and the students and the people that our students need to become to solve those problems and to address the things that our world needs us to address. And by that, I mean everybody's personal world. That is really, really important. And what we're doing here will make a big difference to that. Our alumni donors keep this legacy of building exceptional engineers strong and help us to remain at the forefront of engineering education and keeping students inspired and successful. Today, I want to welcome 130 alumni and friends who plan to join us from all over the world. People are signing in from Florida, from Washington State and from Minnesota and coast to coast across Canada from Vancouver, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Ontario, all the way out to Halifax. All right, I knew that. So it's really wonderful to have all. The thing is, where do you? Well, it's down here, it says. There we go. Okay, there we go.
Does that, I'll just get you to unmute yourself. I uh, just had to do a quick mute all so. There we go. The Dean has her voice back. It's always a good thing when I get my voice back. Thanks, Carlene. That that actually is really helpful for everybody when we get some of the background noise out of the way. And uh, so thanks for that. Please feel free to share what you hear today with your, your friends, yes. your <laughs> high school aged kids, grandchildren. Uh, we're having a student focused event tomorrow. Um, on Tuesday, November 17th. There's an RSVP link in the chat for those of you that may want to sign in or bring a friend. And that will be another exciting opportunity to hear more about the first year program. Before we get things started, I just want to introduce some people that are here today from our team in engineering. Uh, Dr. Bruce Sparling is our Associate Dean Academic. And he has been the champion for this vision through the whole thing. From the first meeting I had when I interviewed here, um, through the first visioning workshop we had for our strategic plan, Bruce has been clear that he wants us to have the best first year engineering program in the country. And he has been unwavering in championing that vision. Uh, we've got Lara Charbel and Arliss Sadolsky here. Um, Lara and Arliss, could you turn your videos on so that people can see two of our students that are involved with the piloting? Hey, Lara. And Arliss, I'm looking for Arliss. I'm sure she's going to show up. There she is. So these are two of our first year students this year that have been studying remotely since last March that have been real, uh, really given us valuable feedback as we go along. So they're going to be here to answer your questions as we go through the session today as well. Alana, could you turn your video on? Alana is our Indigenous people, our Indigenous student community coordinator. And she's joined us to answer some questions about the Indigenous component of the curriculum. Um, we are in the process of reclaiming part of our history and building pathways so that students have an equitable chance to succeed. We know that if we can get students through the first year of an engineering program, their success rates are the same as any other student, but getting the skills that are needed to succeed in university and the cultural context to feel at home those are both really important things that we're trying to build. So Alana's going to be here and have a little bit of conversation later. Thanks for turning on your video, Alana. As always, we're thrilled to have you here. And last but certainly not least, the first year redesign team. Uh, Sean Ma is our Huff Chair in Teaching Innovation, and Sean's had his camera on for most of the introduction here. Um, Xiao Bo is joined us, is it a year and a half ago now, Xiao Bo? One year and uh, just a year. Days. And then Xiao Bo got, got uh, invited into the deep end and she's been uh, deep into it. Joel Frey is not able to join us today. Joel has been involved with the project on contract and in different forms and is now a permanent member of staff. Um, and he is, uh, as I said, not able to be here today, but Sean and Xiaobo are very well able to speak to the work that he's doing. So a huge thank you to the enormous amount of work that's been done by the first year redesign team. Just a remarkable, remarkable transformative vision and a lot of work building not just consensus, but enthusiasm around the project and real commitment from an enormous learned team of academics. There are about um, 25 to 30 people involved with this project across campus and keeping them all on the bus is sometimes a challenging job. And the number of conversations that Dr. Sparling, that Sean Ma, that Joel, that Shalbo have had 
I think we are probably into the thousands by now. So it's just been an enormous job of keeping the team together. And the heavy lifting of getting the curriculum redesign done has also been just a, a really impressive piece of work. So hats off to the redesign team. I want to pass the floor back to Carlene now, who will take us to the next item on the agenda. And I just, I see Ron and Jane Graham have their video on. So a shout out to Ron and Jane. We're delighted to have you with us today. And Al Schreiner, who I was talking with earlier, is one of our long-term supporters of the Engineering Advancement Trust. And I know that Myron Stadnick is gonna join us, who's chair of that group as well. So I'm not sure if Myron is here yet, but a big thank you to the Engineering Advancement Trust. So over to you, Carlene. Perfect, and yeah, just to echo Suzanne, Ron and Jane, thank you guys so much uh, to the Engineering Advancement Trust and the many, many alumni that are also involved with that. Um, you guys really power us. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Dr. Bruce Farley. Thank you, Carlene, um, <clears throat> and welcome everybody today. Uh, as, as Suzanne mentioned, this is really, I'm very excited about this program. This has really been a dream of mine for a very, very long time, and, um, and I'm, I'm just exceptionally happy with how it's, it's worked out. Uh, from the very beginning, we've worked with uh, educational experts at the Gwena Moss uh, Centre for Teaching and Learning, to incorporate uh, the most up-to-date, the best practices in uh, in teaching and acknowledging how students actually learn, and so we've we've incorporated many things that uh, to, to make that happen. So I'm going to just run through very quickly some of the the main features, and I won't go into any depth because I know our first year team is gonna is gonna do that more for you later. But just to show you some of the the features that we've incorporated in here that we're very proud of. So uh, I think the first and, and most important feature is that this uh, program is going to be delivered by a team of teaching um, specialists who each are excellent teachers in their own right and are dedicated to making sure that this, this uh, project works. So uh, that is a very, very important thing. Um, as you'll see that the program, unlike you know, current programs where you, or where you go through uh, classes of set lengths uh, through the whole term, this one's gonna be, this one is designed in a modular fashion to recognize that some things are better learned in short, intense bursts, while others you need time to, to sit on it, to think it, let it percolate uh, in order to learn it effectively. So that's that's one of the features, and in also in moving to this modular design, it allows us to uh, sequence material more intentionally. So what you learn in one class will be applied uh, very soon after that in another class, and, and they'll give you examples when they talk about this. Um, but it is uh, it's a much more effective way of applying things, tying it together, showing students that everything that they're learning is more relevant and connected. Um, we've also, as you'll hear, we're moving to something called competency-based learning, where uh, we're going to ensure that students master uh, certain fundamental skills and knowledge. And um, because these are so important to what's going to happen to them throughout their program and their career, we're going to give them multiple attempts to master these fundamental skills, and we'll support them in that process in an unprecedented way. So uh, that's all going to be explained to you. Um, the program is going to focus very heavily on skill development and job readiness. Uh, we'll, we'll have things like programming, um, drawing and sketching, CAD, technical communications, applied research, among many other things. And so we're hoping that students coming out of our first year already will have valuable engineering skills they'll be able to take out and get jobs uh, right from, from year one. And um, the last thing I'll mention is that we're hoping to, to uh, provide students with a more in-depth experience in the various engineering disciplines so that they'll be in a better place to make their decisions moving forward. So all of this is uh, is taken a lot of work, as Suzanne said, and it's taken an unprecedented collaboration with uh, partners from across the, the campus. 
and and I can't really overstate this because um, it's really really taken a lot of work with people with uh, people in arts and science who had to get on board and buy into the vision and and they've done that and I think that this is really it'd be hard to do at another institution uh, other than the U of S. So uh, I just want to um, thank those uh, people especially. So um, like any other engineering process, uh, before we roll this out in, uh, in full, next fall, we, um, we wanted to do a pilot study involving as many of the, the concepts that we could um, into, uh, into this pilot study. So what we did is uh, this term in our GE 124, which is uh, engineering mechanics, uh, one class statics, as you all probably took when you went through engineering. Uh, we've we've gotten the um, the instructors in that, two of which are are part of the first year development team, to incorporate some of these features: the modular design, the um, competency based learning. And so, um, what we thought we would do here is invite a couple of the, our students that are taking this class. To, um, to talk to you about their experience. So as uh, Suzanne mentioned, we have uh, Lara Sharbel and Arliss Sidlowski. So Lara is, uh, is from Saskatoon, but she just moved here from Germany three years ago. And uh, she says that she chose engineering because uh, it offers a way to find complex solutions to uh, difficult problems. And it's a great way to help others. And uh, our other student member is Arliss Sidlowski, who's a first year student from Weyburn. And Arliss is our newest uh, Schulich leader and recipient of a $100,000 uh, Schulich leader scholarship. So uh, we're, we're thrilled to have both of these students with us today. And so I'm just going to ask uh, them both a couple of um, questions and uh, just to, to let them um, get, tell you in their own words, um, how these uh, changes are influencing their learning experience in this class. So um, my first question, and I'll ask uh, each of you in turn. Um, so what's been, in your view, what has been the, the best part of, of G124? What is it that makes uh, what you're doing in that class different and hopefully better than, than what you're seeing in your other traditional classes? So I'm going to ask uh, Lara to... Um, to start out. So GE 124, what do you like about this? Um, so of course, uh, we can start with the, how they um, have incorporated live lectures. And so all around um, how it is more adapted to how things are right now, but more specific, I guess, to the re-engineered program. Um, they uh, putting everything competent competency based, like with all the learning outcomes and uh, uh, it's it's a lot easier to evaluate for yourself where you are in the course and uh, to know okay which things I have to work on and which not and it's um, in a way it makes you like it's able you're able to prepare better for um, like exams and other things and uh, really make sure you understand uh, the content and everything that's going on in the class. Thank you very much, um, Arliss. What do you like about uh, 124? Oh, uh, I love this class a lot. Uh, one thing in particular I really like is how it's been split up into um, how the content of it has been split up into uh, the different levels of difficulty. So there's the type A, type B, and then type C, and they're each progressively harder. So you can monitor how much you actually um, how much you know and how much you are learning and what specifically you need to work on. And that's back to the different outcomes. As you can see on the assignments, there's each question is assigned an outcome. And then on the module tests, it's the same thing where they're assigned outcomes. And then if you um, realize that you're doing poor on an outcome, you can look into it and then you know what you want to work on more. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. So my my second question, extension of this, and that is, if all of your classes were taught um, like 
124 and incorporating these these ideas that you're seeing in that class how do you think that's going to benefit the students in in the coming years as compared to uh, what you're experiencing and which is you know very much what most of the people on on this call would have been experiencing in other classes so i'll i'll start maybe with our list this time since you're already uh, ready to go so what do you think uh, how do you think if all your classes were lists, how, how would that uh, affect your learning experience? Um, I think it would really help with um, being able to have a deeper understanding of the content and not cramming it all in. So with having module, having it split up into more modular based and then having exams for the sections. And then you also have the option if you do pour on a module exam then there's the redo option and i think that helps make it so that you're not as stressed for the exams and so you'll do a better job of studying for them and it'll just kind of spread out the learning into a longer frame instead of um, packing it in <laughs> last minute and then forgetting about it right after okay great laura do you want to add anything to that um, yeah, I, oh, oh yeah, I, I agree with Arliss. Basically, it, it helps a lot since also everything builds on top of each other. Um, you, yeah, have a way more depth understanding, and I, I would like I would think you know that will definitely help with the terms to come, um, and maybe also even just um, having a way of how to learn and in later years maybe even sectioning for yourself these type A, B, and C in each course. Um, and if you understand the basics, you can move on to, to type B, which I guess later on is explained better, but um, it's, it's, it's a way better way to structure it for yourself. And if every class is like that, um, it, it will be a lot easier and like more, yeah, easier to understand every content. Great. Well, thank you so much for these insights. And, and I know that it, it's a very unnerving process to, to uh, put yourself out there in front of all these people. And we really do appreciate your taking the time and, 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 and uh, agreeing to do this for us, because I think it's a very important message to hear. So um, I will pass it back to Carlene, and we can move on to the uh, next item in the agenda. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Bruce, Arliss, and Laura. It's really wonderful to hear the student experience. Now I'm going to pass it off to Alana, who is our Indigenous Peoples Coordinator, to speak a little bit more of what this means for our Indigenous engineers. Hi. Um, yeah, he said my name. Uh, I. Married with uh, and I uh, live on. And uh, I've worked with Indigenous for many years in university. And the one thing that really uh, drives a lot of students is community, that need for community, and especially for Indigenous community. How we do that is we connect them with um, events, with elders. Um, with the knowledge uh, systems to help them kind of kind of connect into that indigenous knowledge so that they are you know successful as students and they connect with each other as well um, there's a wonderful cohort of uh, indigenous students that currently we have here and uh, potentially with our indigenous student ambassadors which were just hired this past week um, they will be doing a lot of outreach as well to connect with community and to get them uh, involved in in this first year so this first year redesign has really been uh, promoted to indigenous students um, in many different communities and we're hoping that by creating more cultural content and cultural knowledge. Um, we are preparing those engineers for when they do work with these, they have the cultural knowledge to uh, connect with elders and um, and people in the community and to do that well. So um, so those are some of the, the work that I'm doing with the communities. Um, 
and uh, connecting them with engineering so that you know they are successful and connect with other Indigenous engineers as they move along into their professions. Yeah, and I'll be around if or ask any ask me any questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Alana. Now I'm going to pass it off to Sean and Shelby Old, and they are members of our team that founded the first year re-engineered program. So Sean, I don't know, were you guys planning to use the presentation today or are you just going to speak to it? Um, Carleen, if I can, I'll I'll share my screen and we can maybe talk through a couple of the slides. Sounds great. Okay, so here we go. So hopefully everybody can see my screen now. Um, you may need to select it so it's bigger, but uh, this is this is a rough breakdown of the layout of the new first year. And you can see that it is not five or six courses uh, going 12 or 13 weeks in parallel. It's, it's quite a bit more complicated than that. And, what this allows us, this flexibility allows us, is for just-in-time learning and better coordination of our courses. So, uh, as we start in September, uh, the intro to engineering, this is getting the students uh, familiar with the system of how the first year is going to run, um, our expectations around behavior, and also um, some initial preparations, including uh, a cultural uh, component around indigenization so that we'll be able to work in some indigenous examples throughout the curriculum later on. One of the other noteworthy features is, is an intense computer science course. So they're getting their first programming course early on in September and October. And that's going to allow the students to do programming, to apply their programming skills for the rest of the year. So we're going to include programming in subsequent courses. They'll have their first mechanics course. Uh, the math course is now integrating calculus and algebra together with some basic statistics as well. And we're now mixing up integration and um, uh, integration and differentiation within each term to better align with the needs of the rest of the curriculum. We will have a focus on communications. There's going to be a new element of electrical circuits in first year for, um, there hasn't been something really for electrical engineering in first year before now. So we're introducing that. And also in the electrical circuits course will be an introduction to MATLAB, which will build on learning Python in the computer science course. You'll see at the top natural science series. One of the major themes of the first term um, is to make sure students are in the right place. Uh, we certainly want to make sure the system works well for giving students a chance if they stumble to pick up themselves and keep going. So we want to try and have a lower um, uh, attrition rate, a higher retention rate uh, through the first year so that they're not um, failing out basically. We give them a second chance with the competency-based assessment basically. But we're also trying to make sure that they're comfortable that they've found the right place in engineering. And we're doing that a few different ways. And one of them is this natural science series where they're gonna work through the major natural sciences, physics, chemistry, geology, and biology to see what their relevance is to engineering and also to see how they compare to engineering. So geology versus geological engineering, chemistry versus chemical engineering, that sort of thing. Um, they're also going to be uh, seeing computer science and mathematics and distinguishing those from what it means to be an engineer. And so later in the term, when we have a design course, um, which will also include drawing and sketching, um, we're introducing them to engineering design and then in the exam period, instead of exams, because they'll be having the major module tests throughout the term, as Arliss and Lara were um, referring to, they're going to finish in December in the exam period with a one-day deep immersion in each of the engineering disciplines. And this is going to help them give them a better sense of what the different engineering disciplines are about and 
how uh, which ones they might prefer to to go into. As we move into the second term, um, this one is a little bit more conventional in its design. You see some of the courses stretching sort of more normal durations. We have a second math course, second mechanics course, uh, another communications element where they're focused on oral communications and poster presentations. They're also going to learn how to learn. We're going to be focusing some of our communications course on learning how to learn so that they can help themselves and help each other uh, instead of relying on their uh, professors and instructors all the time. We'll have e &M, chemistry, another circuits course, and a new course uh, in first year engineering anywhere in Canada that we're aware of on process engineering, which will uh, not just be chemical engineering, but it will focus on process engineering generally, which we think is a universally important area. And it will also be sort of a, a bit of a focus on chemical engineering. We're quite excited about the finish to second year. There will be an intense design course and that'll be broken up into the different disciplines. So students will know what discipline they're going into by April, and they'll be doing design courses in their disciplines, and they will take a bridge course from first year to second year in their disciplines. And this has turned out to be a, a real big positive because all the programs were trying to do sort of funky things in second year to make up for shortcomings in the first year. Now they get to sort of take care of all of that, bottle it up uh, at the end of first year, get the students excited about their choices for their discipline and help transition them cleanly into what is going to be a smoother and more, co more coherent second year for all. Well, of I don't know. I've done everything I always do on any that I've been on and I can't get it. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> OK, and. Uh, and the other, the other point we want to point out is the gray. You can just sort of basically see it at the bottom there, the fall top-ups and the winter top-ups. And Lara and Arliss both made reference to these. Uh, basically, if, if students have some trouble on some module tests or with certain learning outcomes, they will have another chance to make up um, and, and basically get up to that minimum competency level in those areas. And so, um, the basic idea of competency-based assessment, if I can summarize it in one sentence, is this. You have multiple chances on each learning outcome. If you do better on the later chances, they replace poor results on the earlier chances. So basically, you don't have to do brilliantly at the start of something. I mean, if you do, that's great, but if you don't, that's okay you will have second and third chances to make that up and we won't hold those initial attempts against you. So it's it's a more forgiving sort of evaluation and assessment system. And it's more focused on, can you do these skills by the end of the course? We don't care if you can't do them at the start of the course, we care whether you can do them by the end of the course. And so that means there's a few opportunities to try and show that you can do those skills. And you heard Arliss and Lara talking about type A, type B, type C material. Just to give you a quick summary of what that's all about, type A is the very basic, granular, simple stuff. You know, if we give you two vectors, can you take a cross product? That kind of thing. Can you do a simple, basic integral? That sort of thing. The type B questions are your meat and potatoes, basic core competencies. That would be a 2D rigid body equilibrium, a basic 2D rigid body equilibrium question in statics, for example. Um, and, you know, integration by parts, a basic integration by parts question in calculus, that sort of thing. Uh, the type C is the, the tricky, gotcha, hard questions. And those are the ones that will really sort of distinguish the students in, in terms of their grades but every student has to pass all of the type A material and they all have to get at least 70% in the type B materials in order to pass their courses and their modules. And that means that if they get over 50%, that means they can actually do something and they know their stuff at a basic level. 
I'm sure all of us have had the exam, uh, the experience of being an undergrad and maybe getting 60% on a course and really having no idea what happened in that course. The difference now is that if a student passes the course, they will have a minimum level of competency that they will have exhibited and shown that they can do the basics. And so that's going to be one of the bigger differences about um, competency based assessment. Now, we want to you one other uh, major feature just before we maybe go to um, some questions. And that is this schedule. This is the weekly schedule. Now, this is a bit different. All the students will have the same basic schedule. They will have a lab or lecture section in two of them in the mornings. Then they will have a common lunch break. So there, this is going to facilitate social cohesion, joining student groups, uh, having guest speakers in, like some of you. Um, the longer lunch breaks on Tuesday and Thursday will facilitate getting some exercise. And basically, we're looking for a greater community bonding, and, and that's what we're trying to facilitate. Then they have another two classes in the afternoon. After that, breaks and tutorials. These are optional tutorials, but if students need help, we will have TAs and instructors there to help them. And if they don't need the help, then they can go home or go off and do other things. The end of the day is at a quite reasonable time. And furthermore, uh, if you are a mature student with kids or you have a job, you will be able to handle that in the evenings. So these are some of the major features. Um, let's see here. Any other major things we want to touch upon? I think. Uh, Bruce has already hit upon some of the major things. Um, Shabo, would you like to maybe talk about the transition into first year and some of the things that we've been doing uh, piloting this year in that regard? Sure. Uh, like as you can see from the slides, we have the summer top tops, and uh, this year we had the uh, math topics like a calculus and uh, chemistry and uh, mechanics, and uh, so you. Those are the um, high school content you learn that are essential for your learning in college, especially in the first year. So if you can take a look at those questions, they're free, by the way, and we release them during the summer before semester starts. And they are open until like uh, during the semester even, so students can take a look at those questions whenever they have a chance they, as they need. And uh, clarify some confusions they had in high school and uh, uh, get prepared for the first year courses. And those are the concepts uh, help students to learn the first year courses uh, a lot and uh, save us some time for you to focus on the new content in college. And also the, uh, we will have the indigenous components in the first year, new first year courses and uh, talk about those uh, uh, indigenous people's histories and also we may have uh, some uh, modules or workshops about uh, study skills, time management skills, things like that. And we have of course talk about how you can uh, focus on your mental health and prepare for uh, your learning and to keep a balanced life. And uh, during some courses in the modules, you have a uh, teaching components. Uh, so uh, as Dr. Ma mentioned earlier, you, you will know how you can learn and how you can teach your uh, like teach your peers and learn from teaching. And that's a, a very helpful way for you to have a deeper and better understanding of the new concepts as well. And uh, we also, this is something very unique in the first year is the research components in engineering. And uh, uh, you have uh, the chance to take a look at authentic research data and uh, learn how to do fundamental basic research procedures in your first year for engineering and science courses. Great, thanks, Shao. So I think at this point, maybe we'll turn it back to Carlene, unless Carlene, you want us to talk further on some specific points. But if not, I know there have been some questions that have been popping up on chat. Uh, maybe we could open up to, uh, to the group. And if anybody has any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. For sure, that'd be great. We'll just get Bruce and Suzanne to turn on your cameras. 
And then if anyone has any questions, feel free to throw it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and show your video. It's in the time of COVID, it's always great to hear and talk to people, even if we have to see them in a little square. So, um, Sean, I do see a question coming in from Jason. Can a student break the first year over multiple years? Yeah, that's a great, uh, great question. Thanks, Jason. Um, we are, we are creating a system so that a student could take the first year year so it's going to be called our half speed option and so there's going to be a way to do that and for some students that might be the best way to transition into university life is to spread that first year over two years and it is a thoughtful division of um, sequencing of the parts so that they still all fit together and make sense great question <laughs> Yes, uh, Niha. Uh, yes, that's a that's a great question. Um, so Niha is asking, will the disciplines eventually get re-engineered? So here's the um, here's the working plan on that question. Uh, we want to make sure that the first year is a finely tuned engine. So that'll probably take two or three years to sort out, and then um, we will be hoping that the the uh, departments will start picking up on this. Um, who is the chair of mechanical engineering was deeply involved in this uh, first year re-engineer process. And so, uh, you know, mechanical engineering has been looking at this uh, closely and we are hoping that there may be a de some departments who will start picking up on this in the coming years and basically migrated up into second, third, and fourth year. Now, this system will look different as you go up in the years. It, it probably has its greatest value in first, maybe second year, but uh, we're a couple of years away from when we'll sort of focus on sort of spreading it upwards through osmosis. And I noticed I had missed a question earlier on uh, from Melanie Pop, who asked, uh, any thoughts to diversity and inclusion training in the summer top-ups? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. Um, we, we are going to have an indigenization top, summer top-up. So there will be, there will be a summer indigenization. Um, beyond that, not for the summer top-ups. However, part of the introduction to the profession starting in September will focus on, on uh, those factors. So we will be focused on diversity, inclusion, and uh, creating a welcoming environment and making sure that students are interacting with each other in a constructive manner. Um, and I gotta say, actually, this first year cohort right now has been, uh, it's been a really positive, different experience this fall. Um, in some respects, we've been closer to the first years than ever before because we interact with them on chat through every lecture. And, and students are more willing to do that, it seems, <laughs> than when they're live and in person. So we're trying to figure out how we can retain this into the re-engineered first year uh, by providing this extra communication channel so that they um, we can interact with them more closely because it's been great this year in that regard. Wonderful. Thanks, Sean. I'm just, uh, it's great to see Suzanne and Bruce are actively manning the chat as well with any questions. Um, I thought maybe I'll throw it out to the alumni group. Does anyone have a question that they'd like to turn their video or their microphone on to ask? It's a great way to get your answer or your question answered right away as well. Well, we do have a question there from I'm seeing from Bruce Miller. Maybe I can touch upon that one. Bruce, we will be uh, focusing on more hands on skills than in the current first year. Um, that's one thing we haven't been able to pilot very well for obvious reasons this fall. <laughs> but uh, we, we do intend to have more lab experiences, lab activities come. Uh, well, hopefully next fall, hopefully when we're back together again. 
So there is going to be a focus on that and more practical skills for employment at, by the end of first year, including WMIS. Sean, could you talk a little bit about the peer-to-peer -peer coaching and learning uh, module? Because I think that has real implications for the workplace. Yes, uh, thank you, Suzanne. Um, this is one of the things that we're most excited about. The fact of the matter is students learn a limited amount of things from us. We, we, we know that, we accept that, that, that professors are a limited <laughs> bandwidth source of learning. Um, what is a greater bandwidth source of learning are peers and friends. And so we want to help the students how to help each other. It's basically a, a coaching course on how to coach. And in doing part of that is how do we learn? How do we learn effectively? How do you learn effectively? So that we can figure out as students, you know, how do we work best? What, what works best for us and how can we help others? So we're, we're hoping that it's going to be a great leverage um, that can then, as Suzanne mentioned, transfer into industry when they go into industry, that they're more sensitive to A, their own learning styles, and B, those of the people around them. And they'll learn how to help each other better. And we think that we're going to get great leverage from that. Jason Bazalek uh, asking about the admissions process. <laughs> Jason, um, in the early days, we were told you're not allowed to talk about admissions. <laughs> so I, I, I will pass that over to uh, Bruce and Suzanne. Um, admissions are important, we, we know that, um, but that is out of the scope of this project currently. So maybe Bruce and Suzanne can touch upon that. Okay, Jason, that's that's a really important question, and, and it's something that's been on my mind because that's part of my responsibilities is to, to help students from different pathways get into engineering. And, and I think that one of the things that's going to, um, this new program is going to allow is that the modular structure of it, uh, we can, we can um, identify what the student, what skills and knowledge they have coming in and have them only fill in on certain modules rather than having to go back and do entire courses. So uh, we think that this is going to make it much easy to, easier to develop articulation agreements with uh, polytechnic uh, programs, for example, and students coming from other, uh, other either engineering programs or science-based programs or whatever. So uh, that's something we're still working on, but uh, but I think that the new program and the way it's set up does sort of facilitate that in, in some ways. And, and we have another question here from Jim Kells, a uh, really interesting question. Jim is asking, how are we going to evaluate the effectiveness of the program? Um, and so what we're going to do there, we've already started. So we've, we've started doing what we call cohort assessments. And we did that with the last year's group. And basically we had a selection of students, random selection of students, who did 12 hours of testing in, in May on all the different first year subjects. We, we paid them to do this. They did not uh, do this without some compensation. Um, we're gonna do that every year for the foreseeable future. And we're gonna be tracking against the learning outcomes. And it's already been fascinating to see what happens in the conventional uh, teaching approach. And we are hoping that we will see some uh, remarkable changes as we shift towards the re-engineered first year with the competency-based assessment approach. Well, could I, uh, could I encourage uh, other alumni to turn on their cameras and ask a question by asking one? I'd like to ask uh, what the current uh, percentage <laughs> I'd like to ask what the uh, current percentage of first and second year students are female and how this uh, re-engineering will hopefully uh, increase uh, either or both of those numbers. So Suzanne, do you want to, well, I can tell you what our, our numbers are and they've been very, very steady for a long period of time. Um, they're about 20%. 
And, you know, that's, that's fairly common across Canada and, and far short of what, what our goals are. Uh, I think the whole um, <clears throat> uh, direction of the program to sort of focus on problem solving, on integration with all the natural sciences and give a broader perspective of what engineering actually is, um, will I'm hoping that that will appeal to uh, a broader segment of the student population, including female students, uh, and um, to show that you know what we're looking for is creativity, is problem solving skills, is you know just just the ability to break a problem down and solve it using some uh, using technology or sciences. And I think that that in itself will will um, appeal to a much broader than the traditional um, math nerds and physics nerds and, and you know the things that that uh, guidance counselors typically uh, tell students now and we're trying to break out of that mold. So that is a very big impetus for this program for sure. And, and if I can just add, I think uh, we are going to focus on trying to make some of the design projects and the design exercises uh, more, more inclusive of a broader cross-section of students. We see more students coming into engineering now with uh, the motivation to change the world for the better. And, and we need to make sure that there are opportunities for them to start getting a taste of that early on. One of the most successful um, one of the most successful design projects in first year we've had in recent years was where students in groups had to find a client out in the world and they were looking for an artist who needed a way to display their art and so they the students designed um, different ways of different mechanisms, different presentation mechanisms and Two of the two of the top groups actually were offered to start a new business around their ideas, and because they were all interacting with clients, they really felt the relevance of their work to the real world. And you know, this was a relatively simple project. Um, you know, they have limited capable, limited technical capabilities in first year, but a lot of them got very uh, deeply invested in that project. And, and we had a lot of excitement around that. Uh, another one was a cardboard furniture um, design sort of uh, project, and specifically for refugees. This was a time a few years ago at the peak of the Syrian refugee crisis. And we actually had a public display of those, and some students who had been refugees came by, and they were actually crying to see wonderful job that the students had done on this particularly socially relevant project. So we've got to find more like those because I think that really ties into what the students are carrying who are coming into engineering. Perhaps Arliss or Lara could speak to that in terms of you know why they came into engineering and what they're hoping for in terms of, of their aspirations. Um, I'm not sure if you want me to talk, but uh, I, I, I think, <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I came into, and I always uh, wanted to help people. And I think that's um, like having more um, relevant things, doing physical things. I think it gives um, students often, like it gives them a purpose. Like sometimes we do things in class and it's always the question, why, why are we doing this? And maybe having a project that um, focuses on more relevant things will definitely like help um, to excel and be more more excited about what you're doing and uh, which also will yeah benefit the learning experience in my opinion. Yeah, same with me, kind of what uh, Laura was saying about having a purpose. Like the reason I came into engineers, uh, like I wanted to, um, I want to help create technologies that'll make different systems in our everyday lives um, like better and more efficient. And so I think that it's great that in the new first year program, there will be uh, implementations of processes where it's um, we're actually doing more like what it will be in the real world. 
Th thanks, Laura Arliss. Um, as I think everybody can see, you know, the, this idea of real world relevance and making a difference, a positive difference, this is something we are going to focus on more in the new first year. And, and I just noticed a, a, a posting by Douglas Hurd, and he asked, uh, is this program modeled on a current academic program or is it trailblazing? I, I think, um, you know, Xiaobo and Joel and I and, and uh, other members of the team have been involved in the Canadian engineering education community for several years now. And uh, I think it would be fair to say, uh, Jason Baslick knows this very well coming from U of T, um, that there is no single thing that we are doing that is particularly unique. What it is, is putting all the pieces together. And no other engineering program has done that to the extent that we are going to. There are examples. Uh, UBC's mechanical engineering program is, is one that I can think of, and we've talked with those folks uh, in some detail. Uh, but nobody's quite gone so far and so deep as, as we are. And so I think that's what's going to be the exciting element. I know Queens, for example, has dabbled in competency-based assessment but they haven't gone sort of fully into it. Uh, what they saw were the same sort of issues that we're seeing now, but we are going to um, deal with those issues. And uh, we think we have a way to successfully manage them. And, and specifically what I'm talking about is competency-based assessment. It does work better, but it requires more work. I mean, for students to get second, third, fourth chances, well, you got to do some more marking <laughs> and and so we got to manage that and as lauren have both noted well I, actually they talked about the type a material we've just we're we're implementing that on the fly i don't know if 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 our list and laura know that but <laughs> we we are working throughout this term to get the type a material ready when we present it to them it wasn't ready like in the summer we're working on it as we go through the fall these are automated assessments. They're automated assessments where if a student has some problems, they get automated feedback and adaptive feedback. So with this basic level stuff, it's being done, it's being done in an automated fashion. It's taken a lot of work to put it together, but it's really exciting about how the effect of that is going to work. And we're, we're really excited about that. And then the type B material, I mean, that is the meat and potatoes stuff. So we're going to be getting the TAs to doing a, a lot of the marking of that material because it's, you know, it's relatively cut and dry. And the professors are going to be marking the type C material, which is the uh, tricky, harder, um, you know, more difficult material. So we are tackling these challenges that some other universities have partly given up on. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. I just wanted to just mention that our time here is one o'clock. I do believe we still have everyone for roughly another half hour or so, but I know there's many Zoom meetings and um, activities to hop in between. But I just wanted to flag that, that this uh, will be recorded and it's going to be shared after. So if you do have to hop off at one o'clock, uh, please know that we'll be sending an email out with the recordings as well as a copy of Sean's slides. So um, I do notice that we have a few new people joining us on a video, so I don't know if that means that you would signal that you'd like to ask a question, and if so, just please hop right in. Hi, uh, indigenization is a word that I've heard used a lot, but don't really know what it is. I'm wondering if someone could comment on what exactly is meant by that and how it applies to engineering education. Thank you. Suzanne, Bruce, or Alana, would you guys like to cover that question? Hi. Yeah, definitely. Indigenization is is sort of a buzzword um, that's been, you know, uh, lots of different meanings. I think I think for our college, you know, it's really about creating those spaces for Indigenous students. Um, by connecting them with with elders, 
um, on in in my role anyway. I know Sean's it's a little bit different because Sean is talking about indigenization and in, into the curriculum, um, and uh, with the many different programs and initiatives across Canada and in the states, um, inclusion of of culture and identity is is a huge part of that. Um, and then also including Indigenous knowledge into that. Um, one example would have been, um, you know, the use of um, in Indigenous technology, uh, things that were used, um, you know, hundreds of years ago that are still relevant today. Um, so I'll divert to Sean to maybe continue that question. <laughs> sure, well, that, that's a great, great point, Alana. Um, we are already using an excellent indigenization example in design, and that is watercraft. So we compare indigenous watercraft across Canada, including kayaks, dugouts, uh, birch bark canoes, and bull boats. And Amongst those four examples, we see all of the characteristics of great design. And uh, so it's it's a wonderful example. The students really like it because it's it's sort of it's a nice way of making tangible some concepts around you know resource constraints, design objectives, uh, functionality, that sort of thing. Those four watercraft are so different from each other in their purpose, in their materials, in their social significance in the communities that sort of thing so we've already worked that into the existing curriculum and we'll continue that forward of course uh, one of the other examples i might point out is uh is the travois and the travois is sort of a, a triangular set of um uh basically pieces of wood that were used to carry supplies dragging them behind a, a horse or a dog or that sort of thing and we can take a look at that and analyze it from a statics and dynamics perspective. And that shows the students that even something as simple as that can be complicated to uh, analyze. Although if we make assumptions like rigidity, um, that can help simplify the analyses. So we can use, the, the key is to build in the indigenous examples seamlessly so that they are not feeling that like this was just thrown into the curriculum, that it makes sense, that it fits, that it has relevance today. And things like the watercraft are a beautiful example. Uh, the Travois, you know, students look at that, they think they've got an idea about how that works. And then we try and get them to analyze it using mathematics and compare that to how uh, the different ways of knowing of indigenous people how they would have looked at that and how they approach design differently um, on, on a generational level as opposed to a product design level <laughs> in, in, in modern Western society. So it really provides some rich opportunities for learning about design and other subjects like statics and dynamics. I was going to jump in if I could, Sean. Um, so I'm a 1987 engineering physics grad, so I am one of the physics nerds that was drawn into engineering. However, I spent the last uh, 25 or 30 years uh, as an academic, so I've taught first year of physics for engineers at St. Mary's University for the last 20 years. And now I'm an, I'm an administrator, I'm the Dean of Grad Studies and Associate VP Research, and so I'm listening to what you're doing with this program with great interest because we have uh, we're part of the uh, Dalhousie University Associated University Engineering Program. And my own daughter has gone through that program and was quite active in um, engineering student government on her way through. And I'm sure she would um, similarly really be excited about what you're doing here. My biggest question I have, because I, I think this is the way to go from everything, my experience and the challenges of teaching first year engineering for a long time, this is a program that can address a lot of the issues. I'm wondering how you're getting buy-in or have you got buy-in from all of the faculty because the biggest uh, challenge to developments in the academy 
is changing the way we've always done it. And I've been um, personally faced that for a long time. It looks like you have a good design. I'm wondering if you have all of the right people on board. Adam, clearly you speak from wisdom and knowledge. <laughs> uh, the, the building the team and, and really uh, getting supporters on board uh, has been a work for the last three or four years. And, and I guess I would summarize our strategy two ways. Find the right people to be involved. Um, you, you know, if we can get the people who inherently believe in what we're doing, then we're, reduce, we're, we're not spending as much energy on trying to convince people. For those that we do need to convince, um, time, exposure, lots of discussions <laughs> has been a way to get other people on board and really lots and lots and lots of hours of engagement to um, tell them what it's about, get past some of the scary parts. Um, but, but things like, for example, competency-based assessment, this is a 90 degree turn in assessment strategies. And, an example, um, it, in a normal course, you know, you have some assignments, you have a midterm, you have a final. Finals worth, you know, 40%, the midterms worth 20%, assignments are worth X percent, whatever. We're all familiar with that model. Competency-based assessment, learning outcomes have weights. So you say, you know, maybe have six, seven learning outcomes per module the learning output would have weights. And so if somebody says, well, how much is an assignment worth? It's the wrong question. Because if it's an early assignment and you don't do so well on it, it might be worth zero to you if you do better on later assignments. And so it's, it's going to take some training. It is taking some training to get everybody up to speed on this. Um, basically, uh, education of peers and, and learning um, how this is going to work, everybody how it's going to work, that has been probably the biggest uh, task we've faced over the last three years. So, Adam, you're 100% dead on. <laughs> Do we have any other questions that people would like to unmute or, uh, or uh, show their video to ask? I did want to just make a note to Adam that we did get to a point where the project, in terms of leadership, the project came to a real critical decision point in January of 2019. Um, I think that's the right year. It's, yes, that's right. And what we ended up doing was putting a really conscious change management process in place, not in terms of uh, keeping track of dimes and quarters, but in terms of ensuring that we could insulate the design team from some of the harder things that had to be sorted out, like room renovations, fundraising, um, governance processes, and so in order to keep them focused on the pedagogical side, we actually had to put a structure in to support them and keep them focused. And so everyone from the provost to the dean of arts and science to the dean of engineering had to step up and make sure that that happened. So it didn't just happen by having conversations over coffee. There was a really conscious structure that went into place to support the project. And so that that shouldn't be minimized because I think it's part of what we had to do to make it succeed. It's a really massive project. So, and I see Sean nodding, so. Yeah, I just think this is it's fantastic because the Canadian engineering accreditation process has had learning outcomes uh, designated uh, for a long time now where we have to go through every course and, and put it in, but nobody assesses them. You, it's all been phony, right? We've done it across Canada where we pay lip service to learning outcomes, but nobody's actually paying attention to it in their courses. And 
your program is going to force what Canadian engineers have told us for a long time is important. Pay attention to the outcomes. And I think you're finally now going to teach in a way that pays attention to the outcomes. I'm, I'm excited. Uh, I'm look, looking forward to seeing how this goes, you know, for U of S and how it might spread across the country. Thanks, Adam. Suzanne, there's a good question about uh, fundraising efforts and the opportunity for industry to support this. I thought that might be something you'd want to deal with. We also have Rochelle, too, who's going to flip on her camera. I'll that. I'm going to let Rochelle uh, speak to her expertise here. Yes, certainly. So thank you. Was it Ron? Yeah, thank you, Ron, for posing that question. And to answer it quickly, I suppose, thanks to the support of Ron and Jane, we were really able to get this fast forwarded and on the track that it needed to. And now that we're in the final stages and kind of identifying what the lab enhancements could look like and those final kind of capital equipment software teaching needs, there is the opportunity for alumni or industry donors to step up and support that through the Engineering Advancement Trust. So if anybody had any questions about what that looks like, you can certainly reach out to myself or to Bruce and we can answer your questions as needed. And I would say anybody that wants to connect with me through Rochelle or to contact me or Bruce directly, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. We're always happy to engage with people that want to know a little bit more about what we're up to, provide us with some insights that we can't see from where we sit. Um, just engaging with alumni is a real privilege and we really appreciate that opportunity. Um, I'm. Yeah, I. That's cool. Do we have? So maybe just throw your contact information into the chat, and then we'll also include that with the recording. That if anyone does have any questions or would like to sit down with you and the leadership team, that they can do that. I see a question here from Jeff, who's just had a, a steady stream of questions for us. We really the dialogue on the chat has been quite dynamic and fun. In terms of employment. Uh, I want to point out that half of the engineers registered with APEGS to practice engineering in the province of Saskatchewan actually are not resident in Saskatchewan. So there is engineering work that's that's being farmed out. I would say that that is increasingly the case. We're in a global industry and people are working from all over the world to all sorts of places. I would also say that an engineering degree is an incredible foundation for anything that you want to do in life. So I, as an engineering dean, would never lose a single wink of sleep knowing that one of my graduates went off and did something besides engineering as their next chapter of life. So I think it's a fantastic foundation for wherever you land. Maybe I can, sorry, Sean. Can I add to that? Um, like, I, I think one of the other things that we focused on in the first year engineering, uh, Bruce also addressed this on, on chat, that we're, we're focused on skill development to better prepare first year students to get that first engineering job after first year. Mm -hmm. So we, we've been quite focused on that. But in the broader picture, we also recognize that there are at least four broad trajectories for engineers, actually five. Suzanne pointed out the fifth. Um, the, the first one is going into sort of classic engineering industry. Um, the second is becoming an entre entrepreneur. And we will have elements of entrepreneurship in the first year curriculum. Um, third is research, engineers going into research and certainly if we have a portal for that in our current first year, it's it's engineering physics more than any other program. And those are engineers who want to do research as engineers. And then the fourth trajectory is teaching. And that could be becoming a technical um, trainer in industry. It could be going back into high school as an engineer doing teaching. It could be, um, could be becoming a professor. Um, We've done some initial studies in this area with our students. 5%, 5% of incoming first year students, the, the number one thing they wanna do with their engineering degree is be a teacher mentor type of person once they graduate. We can start help 
we can start helping them to go in that direction with the, for example, the peer mentorship uh, teaching that we'll have involved. Um, we will have that entrepreneurship angle. We will have the exposure to industry through the different um, discipline days. And so we're quite excited about giving equal attention to those trajectories. And then as Suzanne said, there is actually a fifth trajectory. And that is students will go into engineering with no intent of doing engineering afterwards. These are the engineers who are, are believe, these are the students who are believing that engineering is a wonderful preparation for life generally. And then they'll go into law or medicine mm -hmm. or, um, or accounting or something. And we, we see a lot that are interested in going into medicine, uh, you know, a fair number. Um, I've seen some that go into law. Uh, others want to become pilots. They understand their planes better when they're an engineer. <laughs> so, you know, the, those are the trajectories that we're focused on. Can I ask a quick question? Please, um, Suzanne, thank, thank you for your commentary on um, maybe what we'll measure going forward to see how this interesting uh, new innovation plays out. Um, I presume there'll be some sort of regular cadence with which you'll report back to us and uh, I'll wait for that uh, prior. I just wanted to add, Sean, um, you're, you're exactly right. I moved into finance after engineering and um, the ability to break down a practical problem and the ability to apply some good old fashioned hard work towards solving it has served me throughout my entire life. It has been such a blessing and so I'd advise anyone who's interested, and I like the way that you're adding this inclusive element. It's not just to solve a trivial problem, it's to solve a meaningful problem. By drawing in more people to the profession, in principle, you're gonna show them how they can actually have an impact on the world. It, I find it a bit of a marketing effort, but so be it, that's a good thing, to get more people interested in something that's actually gonna have a tangible uh, effect on their world. I can see that being having such a, uh, a great resonance with the younger generations that aren't just so interested in the the battle days of slide rules and hysteresis curves. So well done. I've, I've found uh, the college to be very progressive in many ways. I'm proud to say I'm part of the fundraising, uh, fundraising element that is all over this call. Keep us abreast. Come ask us for some dough when you show us the good work you're doing. Well done all around. Thank you so much. That's uh, great to hear the enthusiasm. Um, I do see our questions. It looks like people are slowly having to leave for other meetings. So I don't know if we want to take maybe one or two more questions and then let everyone have uh, their afternoon, potentially their morning, depending on where you're tuning in from. And it looks like we maybe no questions. It looks like we've maybe hopefully done a great job of answering questions. I'm going to pass it off to Suzanne. For just a few closing remarks. I, uh, I couldn't get a word in edgewise all the way along, which thrills me to death, particularly since the questions were about inclusion and indigenization and a lot of things that I was able to answer in the chat. And so I want to thank the team for really being on side and really jumping in with both feet on all of these things. Uh, a couple of comments as the Dean in terms of both inclusion and indigenization. I want to pick up on something Kajal said just a minute ago about bringing different perspectives to the table, because I really think it's about ensuring that we get all the all the lenses on a problem before we try to solve it, not in a slowing things down way, but in a being smart way. Because when I talk to people in industry, they talk about including their ops teams and the most highly skilled tradespeople in the initial stages of a new design so that the operability improves, the first testing goes better, because it's a different set of eyes at the table. From the same perspective, when we learn how to work respectfully and inclusively with community, it doesn't matter if it is building Merlis Belcher Place as a partnership with the city so that everybody gets a better hockey rink and the university has a facility it needs, 
or it's building water systems for communities with communities that actually work with the conditions they're living with. Those voices are really important for enabling the infrastructure projects of the future. And so starting students with an understanding of how to talk to a lot of different people and understand what they can see, I think is really important for where we're going. And when we include more people, we get better answers. So when I was in graduate school, my PhD advisor actually looked at me and said, why would you want to do engineering and work so hard just so you can stay home and raise babies? <laughs> I said, well, that's not actually my life plan. Um, but one of the reasons that I'm here is because my mom had to drive a car where she actually physically could not move the seat close enough to the steering wheel to reach the controls because I was a little kid on the passenger side trying to move the lever. And now that we've got design teams that have all sizes and shapes of people designing cars, it's a whole lot easier to be a good driver. And so I think some of those perspectives and some of those voices at the table really make a big difference to everybody's quality of life. And I really hope that we're building a program that welcomes all voices and all people and finds a place for just about anyone that is willing to roll up their sleeves and do the hard work to be a part of our wonderful profession. So thank you to everybody for joining us today. It's been really wonderful to hear all these voices and hear your, your support in a committed way, not just in a raw, raw way, but in a very committed way. So thanks, Carleen, for emceeing, and I'll pass the floor back to you. I think with that, we will 